It's hard being uh, the new campus pastor when everyone's like, oh, we love the last guy, so you better be great. So it's like, okay, all right. Um, I, uh, I love sports. Uh, I, like, I love the Sixers. I love baseball. And I coached JV baseball uh, for a couple years because I just love teaching. Like I love getting to kind of work with people. I, I played catcher forever until my knees decided you are done playing catcher. Um, but I lo- just love getting to kind of teach and, and coach students. JV was so much more fun than varsity because they didn't know everything yet, you know, they, or at least they didn't think they did. Like, it was great. Uh, but the team I coached at was a small private school, and we were bad. Uh, we were bad. If you could, uh, like, basically everybody, um, who, every upperclassman who could run and chew gum was on varsity, uh, and so we had the JV team, and uh, these guys were great. I mean, it was so fun to get to spend time with them. It was really a fun team, but we were not good. I mean, we were not good. I got really, really well acquainted with the mercy rule. Um, you can lose after three innings. I don't know if you knew that. It doesn't have to be five. Um, it's rough. It's rough. And so we had a rough season, fun season. But we did not win a lot. I mean, we were pretty bad. And so there's this one game. We're playing in Garnet Valley. And the game does not start well because we have one, we really have two good pitchers, but the varsity coach kept taking one of them. Thanks a lot. And the other guy who was a good pitcher didn't want to pitch, like did not want to pitch. And so there were times where his arm would hurt because he didn't want to pitch. And I don't blame him. He's like, I listen, I didn't ask to pitch. You're asking me to pitch. He wanted to play shortstop. So we go to Garnet Valley in the first inning, gives up a couple of hits and his arm hurts. And again, I don't blame him. I'd have said that too. It's like, listen, I don't want to be out here anyway. This is where we were at the state of the team. So we bring the team into the, to the mound when, when we have to take them out. And so we get in there, and I just look at everybody. We're like, okay, who wants to pitch? <laughs> that's, that's where we were. Like, that's just, that's where we were. So this kid steps up. He's like, oh, sure, I'll pitch. And he just, it's the game of his life. He pitches the game of his life. And we get in to the bottom of the seventh inning, and we are up three to one. And I just, I cannot believe it. I cannot believe this, thing, right? They have runners on first and second. There's one out in the bottom of the, uh, bottom of the seventh inning and a ground ball gets hit to the infield and we turn a double play and the coach that I'm coaching with, we just freak out. But the, the umpire calls him safe at first and he was out. I am telling you he was out, but he called him safe at first and we're like, no, this is our chance. I just, we just lose our minds. We're like, there's no way we can get another out now. Oh, so we're just, we are losing our minds, like trying to remember, like, okay, I'm a follower of Jesus. I probably shouldn't freak out right now, but oh, we are so close. We give up another hit. The bases are loaded, two outs. This is over. We have no shot. We miraculously get the, se- the, the third out in the seventh inning. We win the game and we storm the field like it is the World Series. The varsity team had finished their game early. They're up standing by the fence. They're excited too. All of us just pile on. The head coach of varsity is like, we're going to get ice cream afterwards. Oh, it was incredible. It was an incredible moment. We had lost so much. We just wanted to win. We wanted to win so badly. We just needed a little bit of victory. We just needed a little bit of victory. And we're going to look at that idea this morning as we continue our series, Impact, looking at the book of 1 John. John talks a lot about that idea here. And that's important to us because if if we're honest, we want to win. We want to win it. We want to win at life. We want to win at stuff. We just want to win. But if we're really honest with ourselves, there's so many areas where we feel like we're losing right now. And I don't just mean the pandemic and all that happened, because you're probably tired of talking about that stuff. We've all gone through that stuff. I don't even just mean what we've lost over the last two years. I mean just what we feel like, we, we're areas in our lives where we feel like we are losing now. You feel like you're not a good enough parent. You feel like your marriage is going through a hard season. Are you struggling to make ends meet? Do you feel unfulfilled at your job? Are you feeling lonely? So many areas where we feel like we are losing right now. But John, as we look at chapter 5, gives us hope. If you've got a Bible, you can turn with me to John, 1 John chapter 5. We're going to look at the first five verses. 1 John, not the book of John, 1 John. It's towards the end of the Bible. And John starts off like this. 
It says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. John talks about victory and overcoming the world. And that kind of victory, man, like I could use more of that in my life. But I want to kind of frame this a little bit for you. Remember that John is talking to a fractured community community that's been dealing with kind of false teachers, that's really kind of separated the church, and he's dealing with this this fractured community. He starts and ends this section the same way that that he starts and ends so much of 1 John, by talking about Jesus. And he says this idea of being born of God. And so I just want to explain kind of what that means as we dive in. He says, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And that idea of born of God or new birth is that picture of transformation. If we're made new in Jesus, when we trust Jesus as our Savior, when we surrender our life to him, God makes us new. We are renewed. We are restored. What is broken in us through sin has been renewed and made new through Jesus. So it's that rebirth, that new birth, not an actual new birth, but this spiritual new birth. And he talks about overcoming the world, about really triumphing over the forces of evil, over triumphing over the the oppression that would seek to hold us down. But it's a victory, and that is the victory that Jesus has won for us, and we'll dive into more of that later. John gives us some specific examples of what to do here. I mean, he really kind of walks us through this stuff. He talks about believing in Jesus. He talks about loving God and loving others, and he talks about obeying. We're going to unpack that stuff. But it's fair to ask at the beginning why these specific reminders. He talks about the same stuff all the time. I was explaining this to someone this week as it was hard to kind of pull this sermon together. It's like imagine writing a sermon based on the last seven minutes of someone else's sermon. Because John's talking to people and he's just kind of summing up these ideas that he circled back, back and forth around. And so we're going to see some of the same themes. We talked about love last week. He, he really hit that hard last week. So why the repeated connections to things he's talked about? Why repeatedly pointing back to love? Why repeatedly pointing back to Jesus? What I love that John is doing here is John's, it's less that he's trying to define the source of the problem and more he's trying to point to the source of the solution. John's not trying to construct a better argument than the false teachers. He's trying to point people to the transformational truth of Jesus. One writer says it this way, John doesn't diagnose the source of the conflict, instead he concentrates on the remedy. He keeps pointing us back to Jesus. He's pointing us to this simple but deeply profound truth, that a life transformed by God, a life impacted by the completed work of Jesus, a life lived in the power of the Spirit, that life can't help but experience healing and share that healing with others. So when John wants to see this fractured community restored and these fractured relationships and these fractured lives, he just points people over and over and over to Jesus. When we understand who God is and what he's done for us in Jesus, when that truth defines and shapes our lives, then love for others, then reconciliation, then restoration, they can't help but follow. They can't help but follow. So there's three specific things that we're going to look at here as John talks about achieving this victory. First is this, we win when we believe. We win when we believe. John says in verse 1, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. Starts with believe. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is the Messiah that's been sent, that Jesus is the rescuer. It starts for John with belief, and it ends with belief as well. In verse five, who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. He's not only directly pushing back against some of this false teaching, but he's reminding people it starts and ends with Jesus. Folks, if you can only do one thing right in your relationship with God, if there's only one thing you get, get Jesus. Because you get Jesus, you get everything else too. 
It's the buy one, get like a bajillion other things for free. Get Jesus. John's pointing people back to who Jesus is. That's really what communion is, as we've just participated. It's a celebration of and a participation in Jesus' victory. Because what he's saying is this, Jesus has defeated sin and death. Jesus has defeated our enemy, the source of strife and pain and discontent and anger and hurt. Jesus has defeated those things. We can't do anything else well if we don't first know Jesus. And everything else is different and, and is more accessible to us when we know Jesus. Because Jesus is, is the source of the power that enables us to do that. He enables and empowers us to live this different life. If we could just figure it out on our own, we'd have done it by now. If I could figure out how to just be a better person, I would be. We're limited by our brokenness, by our fallenness. We're limited by our humanity, and we're, we're limited by our sinful hearts that lie and that whisper in our ear, it's, you know better. You know what you need. You know where to find joy. You know where to find happiness. You don't need God. You can do this on your own. John reorients us back to Jesus. We win when we believe because we get to participate and experience the victory that Jesus had. Jesus' victory becomes our victory when we trust in him. Think about that. It's like finding out which team wins the Super Bowl before the year and you get to buy all the swag and buy the jersey and pretend that you were a ground level fan before this ever happened, like everyone who was rooting for Tampa Bay last year. We get to know the answers to the test, right? God slides us an answer key and he's like, trust me, they're all right. And all we got to do is copy it down. We get into trouble when we're like, I know that says C, but I think I know better. That really feels like A to me. It really feels like an A. We get to participate in Jesus' victory. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in Jesus? And before you say, yes, of course, that's why I'm here in church this morning, or that's why I'm watching online. Before you say that, what are the areas of unbelief in your life? Because believing in Jesus isn't just like, well, I believe and now I'm good. It's how do I surrender more and more of my life to him? How do I let him into more and more aspects of my life? How do I stop closing off parts of myself to him? What areas of unbelief are there in your life? Where is Jesus smaller to you than he should be? Where is Jesus smaller to you than he, than he truly is? We win when we believe. It starts with believing. Everything flows out of that. But the second thing that John talks about here is we win when we love. We win when we love. 1 John 5, 1, the second half of that says, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. Right? We win when we love. So what we see here is it's, it's love of God, but it's also love of others. It's a multi-directional love. We don't get to aim it only one way, and we don't get to choose where to aim it. We love God and we love others. And I love that point there. Everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well, Right? One of my best friends in the world lives in Wisconsin. I love this guy. And he and his wife are in the process of adopting a child. So we got to see him and his wife over the summer, and they brought this sweet, sweet little boy with them. I've never met this boy in my life. We don't share any common interests. I'm an adult. He's four months old. Well, maybe food. Maybe we both like food and sleep. Okay, maybe we do have common interests. Okay. Well, I don't, I don't know him, but the moment I see this kid, I love this kid for this reason. I love his father. I love his father. And his father loves him. I can't not love this kid because I love the father. I love my friend, and my friend loves this, his son, and so I, I love his son too. I can't love my friend and not love his son. And you might be thinking, well, sure, you can like somebody and not like everything they like. And, it's, and I'd say, that's absolutely true. And that's not what I said. I said we can't love the Father and not love who the Father loves. We can't do it. We can't do it. And it's not a, an obligation issue either. This is a God has enabled and, and empowered and compelled us to do this, that we are able to love others because God has loved us. God allows us to love when it's hard, when it's difficult. If we love someone, if we really, really love someone, we love the people they love too. 
1 John 5, 2 continues this idea by saying, this is how we know, this, sorry, this is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. Now, at first, that seems backwards. Because what John has said other places is, well, if we love God, then we love others, then we love his children. But John is saying those two ideas are so intrinsically linked, it works both ways. This is how we know that we love others, because we love God. What he's saying is, because we love God, we then cannot possibly not love others. We have to love others. It naturally flows out of that. Our love for others shows our love for God, and our love for God shows our love for others. It works both ways there. When we fail to love others, that failure is really a failure to love God and obey him because God has called us to do that. I love my family best when I love God first. When I'm disconnected from God, when I'm in a spiritually dry season, I've just got less to give to others, less love to pour out because I've cut myself off from the source of love. And folks, if we're honest, we struggle with that right now. Christians struggle with that right now. We struggle with loving others. Some of you might be thinking, well, he's only talking to people inside the church here, Josh. He's saying brothers and sisters. And I would say that's fair. He is talking specifically to people inside the church here because this is a fractured church. But he's also talking about everyone else. And the way we know that is when John points to Jesus as the source of love, Jesus is the one who says, love your neighbor as yourself. Who's my neighbor? Everyone. Jesus is the one who removes any limits from who we love, that we look to love others the way that we love. And you might be thinking, well, what about the people who've been difficult? What about the people that have been hard in my life? What about the people that haven't earned the right to be loved? What about the people that have let me down? What about the people I disagree with? What about my enemies? What about the people in my life who don't deserve it? I'm not saying it's easy. Can you think of any stories where someone is wholly undeserving of love and yet someone loved them anyway? John can. And he's been talking about it through this whole letter because that's Jesus. Loving people with an unmerited, undeserved love. There is no sense that we, I think we kind of like to think of our life as like a football field and we stand at the 50 yard line and heaven is in one end zone and hell is in the other. And we're jumping up and down at the 50 yard line, like waving to God, like pick me, pick me God. When the reality is we're on the 30 yard line running full speed towards hell and God chases us down, grabs us and drags us back to himself. That's what unmerited love looks like. God moving towards us in our rebellion and rescuing us out. When did it become okay for us to hate people we disagree with? When did that become okay? God has called us to more, to love others. When we see that we're not doing that in our lives, when we're not loving others, the question we got to ask is why not? And where am I not loving God fully? John's asking us to love with an unmerited love precisely because that's how God has loved us through Jesus. We win when we love. We win when we love. We experience the richness of the gospel in a deeper way when we love. We understand who Jesus is a little bit better when we love. We identify with Christ in his suffering when we love and it's difficult. But God has called us to love him and to love others, and they are intrinsically linked together. Are you loving God and loving others? That's a hard question. That is an uncomfortable question. That is a question I would rather not ask you because that means I had to ask it to myself a whole lot this week. And what I kept saying is, leave me alone, please. What does it look like if I surrender more of my life? Because John here is not saying, let me, make, let me tell you this stuff so you feel bad. Let me guilt you into this. Instead, what he's saying is, let me point a picture of life that you want to know. Do this, because, not just because I've called you to, but because of what it means in your life. We win when we love. And the last thing is, we win when we obey. We win when we obey. And we got a mixed relationship with the word obey as adults, right? We got a, there's a mixed relationship because on one hand, we love it when we say it to other people, particularly younger people. 
Like I am all for obey when it comes to my children. But when someone tells me to obey, my first thought is, you're not the boss of me. Don't boss me around, bosser. Don't give me your rules. I'm an adult. I'm a grown man. I think we misunderstand what obedience is and what it's supposed to look like, for what it means. Because for many of us, we understand obedience to be the way that we get God to like us. Right? I, obedience is me doing the stuff I'm supposed to do so that God likes me. It's doing the stuff that I'm supposed to do so God is less mad at me. Because our default setting for God is that he's just angry and I'm just trying to mitigate that anger by doing as many right things as possible. And there's a lot of people in the church that believe that. And I want you to hear me say, not only is that not what God wants you to experience, that is a, an exhausting pursuit. If my goal in my relationship with God is to do enough good for God to love me, that is a bottomless pit that I will never fill enough. And it will always leave me longing for more. It'll always leave me wanting. But at my heart, I'm a moralist. And so I get that. Like I grew up in the church and I, when I catch myself in my worst moments, I can feel myself trying to earn God's favor. I, like, oh, I got to make this right so, so God and I are okay. And it's like, that is so messed up. I couldn't make it right the first time. I definitely can't make it right now. I couldn't make it right before I needed Jesus to come in and rescue me. Now that I know Jesus, it's not like I can fix it. I still need Jesus. So what does obedience mean? Think of God as the perfect parent. Think of God as the perfect parent who says, stay in the yard, not because he's trying to withhold from us fun and amazing things, but because he knows we want to play in traffic and he wants to keep us alive. Think of obedience that way. It's God saying, I know you. I created you. I get you better than you get yourself. I know what you need to make your life work right. I know what you need to make your life function the way you want it to function. I know how to help you find substance and meaning and purpose and value in your life. And spoiler alert, it's none of the ways you think it is. It's God saying, trust me. God doesn't need us to obey him because he's some cosmic bully that really enjoys watching us little humans like do what he says. God is loving, infinitely loving, and wants us to obey because that is where we find life, the life that we desperately want to know. Obedience isn't living a life of rules and rule keeping. It's a life that says thank you to God for what he's done on our behalf. First John says it perfectly. He says, in fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And that makes sense, right? Doing what someone asks of you is a way to communicate you value and respect them. If you want to communicate you don't value and respect them, then ignore them. As I'm experiencing every day as a father of four. This is my favorite verse, maybe. Unless it's one of my favorite verse in all first John. It's like, yeah, keep his commands. That's how you show you love him. That's how we show we love, by, by listening. But there's more. This is love for God, to keep his commands. And honestly, that should be enough because God is sovereign and in control and we are not, but it goes on. And his commands are not burdensome. His commands are good and right and just and true. His commands bring you life. What he's saying is God has every right to tell us to obey because he's in charge. We struggle with that concept because we live in the West, because we live in a democracy with, where we don't like our elected leaders, we can get rid of them. But if you think in the context of a divine monarchy, in the context of a top-down autocratic system where the ruler has all authority, regardless of what anybody says, this means something different. Because God has every right to say, do what I say because I'm in charge. But he says, do what I say because I love you. Because I know what you need better than you do. One theologian that I like says it this way. says, the reason why we do not find the commandments of God burdensome lies not, however, only in their character. It lies also in ourselves. Namely, that we have been given the possibility of keeping them. Not because we're great, but because Jesus makes that possible. Because when God looks at us, when we know Jesus, he sees Jesus' perfect track record, not our track record of, you know, dumpster fiery failure. That's a good trade for us. 
God intercedes on our behalf. Elizabeth Elliot describes it like this. It is Christ who is to be exalted, not our feelings. We will know him by obedience, not by emotions. Our love will be shown by obedience, not by how good we feel about God at a given moment. And love means following the commands of God. Do you love me? Jesus asked Peter. Feed my lambs. He was not asking, how do you feel about me? For love is not a feeling. He was asking for action. It's what obedience looks like. We're called to obey because in that obedience we find life. I've been going through the, the Bible in a year and one of the macro themes I've taken away from the Old Testament that just hit me reading it all over and over every day is trust and obey, trust and obey. That's what God asks of his people, trust and obey, trust and obey. Because we have a record of every time they don't, it's a disaster. Crazy stuff happens when they don't. The ground opens up and swallows a whole clan. You'll have to come back for that series. Like, there's just some crazy stuff. Trust and obey because God is good and is for them, just like he's for us. Folks, if you're obeying solely out of obligation, out of have to and should, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> you're taking all of the, the negative parts. You're taking all of the difficult parts, and you've lost out on all the love and grace all the hope, you don't have to keep doing it that way. We win when we obey. We experience the victory of Jesus when we obey, and that's what God has invited us to be a part of. I needed this message this week. I needed this message this week. I feel like I'm losing in plenty of areas, and one of them is parenting. I have four kids, and that's a lot, it's more than I thought beforehand. It's turned out to be quite a bit of children in one place. And our youngest is a handful. He is the most stubborn human being I have ever come across. And 70% of the time, he's amazing. He loves Carlos, like loves Carlos. So I'm like, what did you do? And can you write it in a book? And can I buy it? He loves Carlos. 70% of the time, he's amazing. He's super sweet. He's kind. He's thoughtful. Like, he'll randomly say thank you for something that happened two days ago. He's three. So, it's, you know, just to give you context, if he's 20, you'd be like, well, that's reasonable, I guess. He's three. But 30% of the time, it's like he drops his little emotional anchor and he's like, this will not stand. The audacity of you did not give me what I wanted. Who do you think you are, dad, if that is your real name? And he is tough. And I can feel my energy just drain like it's a video game. My little energy meter goes like, Beep. I can just feel it happening. And I just get frustrated and angry. And it has just been hard the last year. And I keep trying to remind myself, like, he's living through the same stuff I am. He's the youngest. He's trying to carve out his space. But it is just hard. It is hard. I said to my wife the other night, I don't know what to do, but I know what we're not doing is, I know what we're doing is not right. It's hard. But what God has really confronted me with over the last two weeks is I feel like I am losing in this area, and that's all I can see. And what God has hit me with is I am asking you to love a difficult, rebellious person the same exact way I love you. Yeah, that's how I felt too. When I realized that, I'm like, oh, leave. That's just, that is too on the nose, Jesus. He's challenging me to say, how do you love your son the way that I love you? As difficult as you think he is, you are exponentially worse to me, Josh. And yet, I am gracious and loving and slow to anger. It has just confronted me that the way I win in this situation, the way I experience victory is not by just going will to will against him. Because what I have clearly seen is I will lose. It's how do I see the victory of Jesus in my own life lived out in real and tangible ways? How do I believe that Jesus is my answer in these moments and is enough for me and empowers me to do what I can't do on my own? How do I love my son when it's hard? How do I obey and, and be faithful with him when I just want to be done? My hope is that by the time he's old enough to understand that I told this story about him, the internet has changed and he can't find this. So that's what I'm 
banking on. That's what I'm banking on right now. My son reminds me of the victory that Jesus has won on my behalf and that it's possible for me to be different and to love when it's hard. To obey when I don't want to. Now, I don't think anything I've shared this morning is like truly radical. Like you're like, I've never heard about this love before, Josh. Where did you discover this? But I don't think that's the point of what John's trying to do here. John is a pastor, and like any pastor, John's winding down here. And so he's saying, let me just cover my themes one last time. The challenge here, it's, it's less understanding this stuff, and it's more doing it. It's more doing it. Because belief allows us to love, and love compels us and drives us to obey. When we love God, we want to obey. We want to move that way. So there is a path forward. Where do you need to experience some winning? Where do you need to experience this kind of victory in your life? What is it for you? I I don't know your story well. I can't speak to you directly, and that'd be a little uncomfortable if I did. Well, Steve, for you, just in front of everyone, let's get into this here real quick. Uh, What is it for you? What's God poking on your heart right now? Where do you need to believe in Jesus at a deeper level in your life? What what unbelief are you holding on to? Is it that you know better than him? Is it that you don't need to kind of let him into everything? I don't know what it is for you, but what is that area? Are you loving God and loving others well right now? Let me tell you, you're not, because I'm not. We can all do better at that. What does it look like for us to love God and love others? Because I can tell you, when we do that well, people want to be part of that. When we do that well, people want to join that. Lastly, what does it look like to obey? Not because we have to, but because we get to live a life that God says, thank you, that you have rescued us out of our brokenness. You have brought us towards yourself. You have redeemed us. You are making something beautiful out of the brokenness of our life. And I obey now, not because I feel obligated to, but because I want to say thank you for what you've done. Belief allows us to love. Love compels and drives us to obey. And when we do those things, we live in victory. I need more of that in my life. And and I think you probably do too. Why don't you bow your heads with me as we close? Father God, we thank you for the victory that you've won on our behalf, the victory that you've won for us on the cross, the victory that you've won over sin and death and pain and hurt, the victory that you've won over our fears, Lord. I need more of that in my life. Father, help me to surrender to you more, more and more and more of my heart. Help us to do that as well. Help us to understand how much you love us, that we might love you in return. Help us to see obedience as a privilege. And Father, thank you that you've moved towards us in this kind of hope. We pray this in your son's precious name. Amen.